Mountains Tampa Bay is proud to present Rescue Tales. Hello, everybody. How you guys doing today? to hear. Now, my name is Jojo. This is Christian. Nobody really likes him. And we work for a company called Conservation Ambassadors. We're actually based out of California. And what it is we do at our center is we give a home to rescue wildlife. Either to animals that have been injured somehow and can't be set free back out into the wild. Those animals are sent to us at our center. Or other times, other times we have a big problem, especially here in the United States, we have a problem with people trying to make pets out of wild animals. That never ever works. It's also against the law. And those animals are taken away and sent to our center as well. Then what we do is give these animals lots of love, lots of attention, and lots and lots of food. And the animals that we can, we train to travel, going mostly to school groups, giving us a chance to share some amazing rescue wildlife up close and personal. Now we've actually been partnering with Bush Gardens for the last 28 years, and we've gotten to witness some of the amazing conservation work they've been a part of. In fact, since 2003, the SeaWorld Bush Gardens Conservation Fund has provided over $18 million in grants to organizations worldwide to help protect some of our most critically endangered species. And since first opening their gates, Bush Gardens and SeaWorld have rescued over 40,000 animals. Yay. <laughs> Definitely yeah. deserves a round of applause. Yeah. That is honestly incredible. And they're some of the best at what they do. So when Bush Gardens asked us to come share some of our rescue wildlife with you, we were super excited to do so. And we brought some awesome animals you guys to meet. And we're gonna start with one of our local friends. Hello everybody, this is Pocket, our Virginia opossum, and this was originally an East Coast animal, but they spread all across the United States while the railroad tracks were being built. In fact, they're brought state to state as a food source. Well, we came across Pocket here because one night a lady was driving home and she saw a cute little furball run across the road, and she had tried her best to stop, but she had accidentally hit that furball. So she got out of her car and saw that she had hit an opossum. However, though, this lady was really, really smart. She had done her research and she remembered reading somewhere that opossums are marsupial. And we know marsupials are out the pouch, but what do they keep in that pouch? Babies. What do they keep in that pouch? Maybe. There we go. So she got down real low. She bravely opened up that pouch. And what she found was five beautiful opossums. One of them being Pocket here. So she swooped them on up and took them to the nearest rehab center where they had the best chance of getting back out in the wild and they were doing great. They were eating, they're foraging for their own food, they're getting bigger and strong and start climbing. They're even standing people except for Pocket here who they had found out was almost completely blind. And because of that, he was unable to release back out in the wild with his siblings. However, though, he found a home with us about two years ago. And I know two years. It might sound young, but these guys, they only live three to four years. But check this out. In those three to four years, a mama opossum, she'll have up to 50 babies. Wow. Yeah. If I had 50 kids, I'd probably call it after three years, too. <laughs> here. He is an amazing animal, though. He is North America's only marsupial. And speaking of marsupials, our next guest comes from the land of marsupials, Australia. But let's give a hand to Pocket, our Virginia opossum. Now this, this is Giggles, and he is the laughing kookaburra. Now this bird here is truly famous for his voice. See, they use the kookaburra's call in the background of every single movie that's ever had a jungle scene ever. It doesn't matter if they're showing an African, a South American, or an Asian jungle, they still use the kookaburra's call, even though he's from the exact opposite climate. He's from the grasslands of Australia, but they use that voice of his because it does sound like he comes from the jungle. If you guys wanna hear it? Yeah. yeah. Are you ready, buddy? Ha <laughs> ha 
<laughs> I love it. Now, although, don't, don't encourage him. Now, although he may be famous for that awesome voice of his, I think he should be famous for something else as well. Because this bird here is an amazing hunter. He's actually the largest member of the Kingfisher family, but he doesn't hunt fish. No, instead, he hunts mice, lizards, and snakes in the grasslands of Australia. I've even seen videos of these birds hunting thin snakes as long as six feet. They'll dive down with that specialized bill of theirs. They grab onto the snakes right behind the back of the head. Then they'll whip them back and forth and back and forth until it's like a limp noodle. Then he'll start to swallow. Slowly swallowing, digesting that snake over three days while the rest of it hangs out the corner of his mouth. Sounds weird. Works very well for the kookaburra, though. Now, somebody here in the U.S. fell in love with these birds. They found a way to purchase one online and brought one into their home. Only this person lived in an apartment complex. Oh, boy. You see, kookaburra are known in Australia as the outback alarm clock. Because every single morning at the break of dawn, they let out that call, that... Let's just say the neighbors were in such a big fan of giggles here, which is why he was sent us at our center. Now, I do love this bird a lot, but being woken up by that call every single morning would be enough to have me pull my hair out, kind of like our next guest, but that was Giggles, the Laughing Kookaburra. All right, and this is Wizard, our turkey vulture, and I gotta tell you, I absolutely love his big, beautiful bald head, but in 10 years, I really hope I don't look like him. <laughs> what this bird does is he wakes up every single morning and he spreads those wings out nice and wide. He starts to take up that sun, and once he gets nice and warm, he takes flight in the sky and he starts getting to work. He starts sniffing for the dirtiest, most rotten, disgusting thing he can find. And once he finds something so gross and rotten, he's going to dive on down and he's going to make a meal out of it. Now I know, we're thinking, it's pretty gross, right? He eats dead things, but for being awesome ourselves, we all eat dead things. Nobody finds a cow to chase it down the road and chew on its leg. <laughs> Only difference with Wizard here is he can eat stuff with so much germs and bacteria, it would make us sick to our stomach. He works perfect as nature's cleanup crew. And that bald head of his is absolutely perfect for that diet. He's diving on down to rotten meat, he wants to keep that head nice and clean. But he's got one really weird trick to rinse off these feet when they're nice and dirty. You guys want to hear it? Yeah. So do you guys want to hear it? Yeah. All right, when those feet get really, really gross and nasty, to rinse them off, he pees on them. Yeah. That's why we named him Wizard. <laughs> and Wizard has been with us for over 17 years. Because 17 years ago, someone had the bright idea to shoot this beautiful bird right in his left wing. Aww. And as we know, birds' bones are hollow, so when they break, they don't always heal back right. And that's what happened to Wizard here. So he can fly a little bit, but unfortunately, not enough to survive in the wild, which is why he was sent on over to us. But brace yourselves, because our next guest comes off a little bit prickly. But let's say goodbye to Wizard, our Hi, beautiful bird soldier. Now this, Aww. this is Boris, and he is the South American porcupine, otherwise known as the Quindu. Now, you guys have all heard about how porcupines shoot their quills, right? So what we're gonna do is on the count of three, we're gonna clap one time really loudly. When we clap, he's gonna shoot 10 to 20 quills towards the audience. So you guys, in the first three rows, cover your eyes. Ready? One, two, three. It didn't work. Let's try one more time. Ready? One, two, three. It's not working. Do you why it's not working? Because porcupines don't shoot their quills. Those quills are just hair. See how that's sharp and stiff and pokey. And when the animal touches them, that's when those needles are left behind. It's not like they're spring-loaded and you can say, fire missile six and shoot them out. But even though porcupines can't shoot their quills, they are amazing creatures. In fact, porcupines make up a lot of the world's largest rodents from the Indian and African crested porcupines that can weigh upwards of 50 pounds and have quills that are around two feet length. 
or the North American Porcupine, the Fuzzy Tree Climber with barb quills. We have right here in the United States, but my favorite to talk about is definitely the South American Porcupine. These Quinn do have over 30,000 quills covering every inch of their body, everything except for their feet, that big button nose of theirs, and the very tip of their prehensile or grasping tail. Now what the Quindu will do is he'll sit in a hollowed out area of a tree waiting for nightfall. Then he goes on his nightly excursion, traveling through the canopies of the South American rainforest with confidence because of that awesome hairdo of his. But let's say a predator does come near him. What he'll do is he'll shake his entire body like a big spiky maraca, banging those quills together to alert that predator that he would make an extremely prickly meal. And he uses that prehensile tail of his to keep his balance as he's traveling through the canopies of the rainforest, reaching out for fruits, flowers, leaves, or the branches. That tail of his keeps him nice and secure up in those trees. Now, we got Boris here from an animal production company that was shut down due to a lack of business. So Boris has retired from a life on the big screens to now doing programs with us. I think he's absolutely incredible, though. <laughs> but we do have one rule for our next guest. And that is, you guys aren't allowed to say, aww, when you see him. Do you know why? Because I'm sick of it. But let's give a hand to Boris, the South American Morning Pie. And this is Disco, our gray fox. And he was found abandoned as a pup by a rehab center. And they took him in with every intention on re-releasing him back out in the wild, but unfortunately, they chose the wrong rehabber to do the job. And she took him home and did everything wrong. You see, she loved on him, she cuddled on him, she let him play with the dogs, watch him eat the kids. So the time that she had brought him back, they had seen that she had completely ruined him. He totally lost his healthy fear and respect to people. So they sent him on over to us about 15 years ago. Now, gray foxes in the wild, they only live six to eight years. Disco here is 16 years old. Yeah, that makes him a bit of a senior citizen, which is why we had to bring him to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> now, gray foxes here, though, they are excellent nighttime hunters. In fact, he's got some cat-like movements that he'll use to scale the trees at night to get to his diet. And he'll eat things like birds, mice, berries, grasses, carrion, just about anything you can think of. He takes care of it. He works perfect as nature's pest control. But you see, we were noticing a problem. For a long time, their populations were diminishing because they were being overhunted for this beautiful coat of theirs. And then if that wasn't enough, we also introduced an invasive species called the European red fox. It started taking over their habitats and their food sources. However, though, in recent years, the great fox populations have been making a comeback, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Now, Disco here, he is cute, but boy, does he pack a punch. And what I mean by that is he is one stinky little man. He's got a very strong odor, one that he'll use out in the wild to detour other males away to let them know this is my space, stay away. But the thing I love about it, he also uses it as his own personal cologne to help him get the lady foxes. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he's stinky, we still love him. Let's give a hand to old man Disco, our great hey. fox. What a beauty. Now this, this is Ebu, and what is he? An owl. Who? Snow owl. Who? Snow owl. Who? <laughs> I'm kidding, that's my only owl joke. You guys are absolutely right. This is Ibu, and he is the barred owl. But Ibu here, he came to our center because he was flying free about 13 years ago when he made a big mistake and accidentally flew down in front of a car. Mm. The person they couldn't stop, and they hit this poor bird, shattering his left wing. But they very bravely scooped him up and took him to a special wildlife bed that saved his life. But unfortunately, he lost his they couldn't save that left wing of his. So he's completely lost the ability to fly, which is why he's with us at our center. But owls are perfectly set up to fly and hunt tonight though. Some things that help them. Remember one of those eyes. Their eyes are so good at seeing at night that if we turned off all the lights in here, if we made it so dark in this room that you couldn't even see your own hand just without light, and we took one little candle with one candle light in the middle of a big room like this, 
This owl can see everything about as well as we see right now. That's because his eyes are. But there's a problem with his eyes. His eyes are so big. His eyes take up so much room in his owl's skull, they're actually stuck, facing straight forward. If he wants to look to the left, he has to turn his whole head to the left. The left. The left. I think he's broken. If he wants to look to the right, his whole head turns to the right. Very good. That's why he has that flexible neck, he can turn his head almost one full time all the way around. Now, it's not like the cartoons can't go around, around, around. If he did that, his head would pop off. But he does have seven extra neck bones, 14 cervical vertebrae that allow him to turn his head 270 degrees, almost one full time all the way around. Now, the second thing that helps him out is in their wings. See, owls have specialized feathers called cone feathers that break up the wind and give them silent flight. That silent flight helps them out in two ways. Because as they're flying through the forest at night, they're not only looking for food, they're listening for food. And if they're up there going floppity, 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 they can hear the mice and the rats that are down there on the ground. The second way it helps them, those mice and rats, they don't hear them coming. He can make a sneak attack to capture his prey. Now an owl this size will eat about two to three small rodents a night. They are a super important part of the balance of nature. They're out there making sure we are overrun by the rodent world. But even though they're such amazing nocturnal hunters, the one thing that they are missing is a sense of smell, which is good because our next guest is famous for being one of the stinkiest animals on this planet. But that was Ibu. Let's say goodbye to the barn owl. And this is Pepe, and what is he? A skunk. That's right, but he's not just any skunk. He's a striped skunk, and you can tell by these beautiful racing stripes going down his back. Now there's also a spotted skunk that lives right here in Florida, as well as a hog-nosed skunk that's got a nose, kind of like a pig. But the one thing all these skunks have in common is that spray. Have you guys heard of the spray before? Well, I'm gonna show you how it works. I'm just kidding, don't you guys worry. That one will be for the end of my career, and it's definitely gonna happen at a junior high school. <laughs> now skunks here, they don't have the fastest feet, he doesn't have the sharpest claws or the strongest bite. So all he's got to defend himself out there with is that spray. So let's say a big old predator comes along and tries to spook him. You know what he's gonna do? He's gonna throw a really big fit. He's gonna start by stomping those front feet, letting that predator know that he is a skunk and he is gonna spray. And if that first warning isn't good enough, He's gonna do full on handstands. And if they don't listen to those handstands, he's gonna spray. And he can spray up to 15 feet. So some of you guys in our front row here, I'm sorry, you're in our spray zone. Now, that smells like the worst part though. That spray gets in that predator's eyes, their nose, their mouth, and it burns. Working like nature's pepper spray. But I do have to tell you, We've had a bit of a skunk problem. You see, once a week at our center, we get a call. And nine times out of 10, it's a group of people telling us they got some skunks coming up on their patio every night, eating all their dog and cat food. And I'm sorry, that's not a skunk problem. That's a people problem. We can't leave food out and expect wild animals not to come up and eat it. The thing is, they do eat it. They eat it, they get bigger, and they have more babies start an issue, but there's an easy way to fix that. If you just take that food at night and lock it on up, he'll go back to the things he's supposed to. Things like slugs, snails, rodents, and all kinds of other pests becoming that helper animal instead of that problem animal. Now, we did come across Pepe here, though, because unfortunately, his mama was hit by a car. And when they pulled over, they saw little Pepe standing on the side of the road. But I gotta tell you, there is nothing cuter than a baby skunk. They look like little killer whales waddling down the road. So she swooped them on up and tried to make a pet out of them. And then if that wasn't enough, she also moved to sink land. So when they got caught, they saw that Pepe here had no way to defend himself out in the wild, which is why he was sent on over to us. Now our next ambassador though, comes all the way out through South American rainforest. And just like Pepe here, she came to us through another illegal pet situation. Well, let's say goodbye to Pepe, our striped Now, let's...
This is Homie, and she is the Kinkajou. Can you guys say Kinkajou? Kinkajou. Bless you. Not <laughs> Kinkajous. They're from the South American rainforest, and they are definitely a nocturnal or nighttime animal. They get up at night, and they are looking for two things. They're looking for fruit, which they eat, and they're looking for flowers. Now, the flowers, they do something very special with. They go from flower to flower all night long, sticking their nose down to the flower to get to the nectar. See, inside of their mouth, they have a four inch long tongue. And they'll use that four inch long tongue of theirs to slurp up that nectar. And as they go from flower to flower all night long, they're doing a super important job. They're cross pollinating. They get that pollen powder stuck to their fur and they cross pollinate those rainforest flowers. There's even certain flowers that only bloom at night in the rainforest. And without pinkajous or fruit bats living in the area, they would not be healthy or be able to survive. Now, homie though, she came to our center because somebody tried to keep her in a tiny little pair cage in their kitchen. Now, does that sound fair to her? No. No, she was taken away and sent to our center about 20 years ago. She's one of my favorite animals to share with an audience. And although she may not look like it, She's actually a relative of the raccoon that lives right here in the United States. From her super sharp canines to her awesome rotating wrists that allow them to go up and down trees head first, her skeletal system's almost identical to the raccoon's. But the thing that sets them apart is that prehensile or grasping tail. They can hang by that tail all day long up in the canopies of the rainforest. In fact, they spend so much time up in the trees they will rarely set foot on the rainforest floor. Kind of like our next guest who likes to spend her days soaring high up in the skies over Eastern Texas. But that is little homie. Let's give a hand to the king you do here. All right, and this gorgeous gal is Tico, our Harris hawk. And these are one of the rare birds that hunt packs. And they do this because they come from harsh environments where their food sources are very scarce. And the only way they can survive is by working together. Now we got Tico here from the Colston program, which is a program designed to take hair socks like herself, breed them, pair them together, then re-release them back out into the eastern parts of Texas, where their populations have been almost completely devastated by hurricanes. However, though, we've had a big problem. Tico here does not work so well with others, and she refused to pair up. She's a bit of a diva. So they sent her on over to us. Yep. But what this bird does have is she's got excellent eyesight. In fact, she's got eyesight six times better than all of yours, probably a hundred times better than mine. And what I mean by that is when she's in the sky looking like a tiny little speck, she can see a mouse all the way down at my feet. And the ridges above her eyeballs, they work perfect. Just like a baseball cap, they keep that sun glare out of her face. So once she spots that mouse, She's gonna dive on down and snatch them on up with her talons. And her talons have over 500 pounds of pressure Ooh. per square inch. So once she grabs her food, she is keeping it. But like I said earlier, I absolutely love these birds because they hunt packs and they do that all by communicating through that white spot on their tail there. You see, they signal other hawks with that tail. It's what we like to call a hockey talkie. <laughs> and they use that hockey talkie to let the other hawks know where their prey is, how they can corner their prey off, so they can dive on down and increase their hunting success rates. It's really amazing. It's why they get the nicknames, the Wolves of the Sky. But that's our Wolf of the Sky, Tico the Harris Hawk. Uh, did you guys enjoy those animals? Oh, yes. Yeah. I hope you did. I hope you guys learned something. But because we get to work with all these awesome wild animals, People tend to ask us this one question. They tend to ask us what our favorite animal is. And I always feel like they're expecting answers like monkeys, lions, tigers, elephants, giraffes, these really impressive wild animals. And we love the wildlife, that's why we do what we do. But my favorite animal, without question, without a doubt, is this next guest. His name, his name is Basil. And you guys will definitely know what he is when you see him. Well, check him out. Come on out here, Basil. <laughs> this, 
This is my favorite animal. I trust him, he trusts me. I know he wants to be with me. You have to know, wild animals belong in nature where they're truly supposed to be. Now I like to end each one of our presentations with just a few easy things that we are able to do to help protect our wild friends. Things like reducing single-use plastics and recycling, or picking up garbage and keeping the environments clean. Or if you find a sick or injured animal in the wild, get it to the Wildlife Rescue Center. There are literally thousands of places set to give animals the proper care they need to hopefully get them back out to the wild. And if there's anything that you guys care about, whether it's people, plants, animals, or the planet itself, get out there and do something about it. If everybody plays their part just a little bit, we make the world an even more amazing place to live. You guys have already done a lot by supporting the park here today, but I want to thank you for being a very fun audience and enjoy the rest of your day here at Bush Gardens, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.